opinion in a matter of Christ's coming, called when he shall appear the second time, and his return, it's also referred to as when he's revealed from heaven, when he comes again, some of these various phrases. Now there is a tendency for men to approach the coming of the Lord in what I term a stereotyped approach in a cold theological sense that really has no life to it. It's more or less academic and centers around information. Much of which is true of itself. There are at least four different uh, approaches to the coming of Christ that men have embraced. Some men have embraced. One is called amillennial. Now, these won't mean a whole lot to people. If all you know is the Bible, these would be completely foreign to you. <laughs> Which ought to tell you something right there. First is a, called the amillennial position, the millennium referring to a thousand years reign. Amillennial takes the position that the thousand years is going on now, which spans from when Christ was enthroned in heaven until when he comes again. The second is a, what is called a premillennial view. They believe that Christ will come before what is called the millennium or the thousand years. And incidentally, in all of these, there's a variety of divisions within them all, which I'm not going to take time to deal with. <coughs> now there's the postmillennial that Christ will come after this thousand year millennial reign. And the fourth is called the preterist view, which teaches, believe it or not, that Christ has already come. And there's one thing that all four of these positions do have in common. Christ's coming is not the point in, either, in any of them. It's not the point. The amillennial now is the point. The premillennial it is, the, is the millennium is the point. And so is the post. The preterist now is the point. Now is the time. But in the scripture, the coming is the point. Now, this is a, a, it seems like a simplistic point, mm -hmm. but it's very critical because these others become bypass. Even though each of these four positions I mentioned, each of them have parts of truth in them. They're not just all 100% false. There's some good points in each of them, but they're systematized. And as soon as you systematize truth, its power is gone. The truth, the power of the truth is found in its affirmation not its explanation. That's an important mm -hmm. truth to see. God works through the truth itself. The power is in the fact, not in the interpretation of the fact. Mm -hmm. Amen. And this allows maybe you don't understand the fact, but that you but you're called to believe the fact. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you're called upon to do. And incidentally, these posi various positions, when they be, they're cr these crystallized views, they don't move a person to readiness. All of a sudden you become interested in other things other than they being ready yourself. And all of them appeal more to the intellect than to the heart. And there's points confusing parts in all of them. There's confusing parts. So I want to approach the coming of the Lord tonight from the standpoint of its relationship to time. The first thing to note in Scripture that the Holy Spirit working through Christ's own words made a point that the time of Christ's coming is obs purposely obscure. Mm -hmm. right, that's the first thing that we want, want to establish. He's gone out of his way to he's gone out of his way to tell us this that it has been obscured purposely. He's not diagnosing what men simply do not know. He's diagnosing what can't be known. <laughs> Jesus said this in Matthew twenty four forty two. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord that comes. So there's, there's one. This is the way it is. He doesn't suggest you can know the hour. You don't. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, this very verse here has confused a lot of people. They say, well, Jesus knows everything. 
Well, how much, just how much did he know when he was in the manger? Huh? Could someone just elaborate on that? How much did he know when he was in the manger? And how much did he know when he was in the temple? We prayed tonight about Jesus increased in wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something he volunteered. This is a handicap he volunteered for, I understand. And what I'm saying here is he's volunteered to forego knowing when. Mm -hmm. And in this, he fellowships, as I understand, with us in his expectation. Yes. Any, any restriction Jesus has, he has he embraced it voluntarily. It's not what we call inherent in his nature. Again, in Mark 13, 33, Take heed and watch and pray for ye know not when the time. See, there is another. Bed, hour, day, time. Or period. <laughs> Whatever you want to call, refer to it. He goes on to say, The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch, therefore, ye know not when. Gee, now there's another view. The master of the house comes at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. You don't know. So he's went out of his way to say, you don't. The bottom line is we don't know. So after all the speculating is done, mm -hmm. somehow you've got to have the courage to get back to Jesus and confess, we don't know. And there's a reason. Because of our human nature and this frail vessel we live in, if we did know it would be a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. would be a disadvantage because you'd be tempted <coughs> To slough off and wait till the last minute. Mm -hmm. So he has princes. This is on purpose. So my point here, in bringing this up, is it's an utter exercise in vanity to try and figure out when Jesus is going to come. If that's what he really wanted you to know, he'd have told you. He did like he did Noah, 120 years. That's how long man's got. One hunt. He told him. And he would have told it like he did Abraham, tell Sarah, about this time next year, Isaac will have a son. He'd tell you like he told Abraham, after 430 years, they'll come out. So God can be specific. Make no mistake about it. But on this subject, he's not specific. And at some point, God's people have to just humble down and say, we don't know. And let it rest there. <clears throat> now, having said these things, it's important that we not be premature in our conclusions about the coming of the Lord. In one passage that uh, is very relevant to what we're discussing here, Paul warned the Thessalonians not to be premature, thinking that the day of the Lord was at hand or just immediately to occur. He says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, or by word, or by a letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. That's a kind of a peculiar statement to make in view of what we've said, but see, uh, we can't be simplistic in these things. There are people throughout history who have said, he's just about to come. Paul says, don't. And this would be troubling to somebody. This would be troubling, disconcerting. He says, don't be troubled. <laughs> this is not the area that God hasn't given us to inquire into. I'm very sorry to say this. <coughs> well, I'm really not sorry to say it. But it's just rhetorical. <laughs> But this is an area God just has not given us to probe around in. So if you if you get us if you have a spirit promotes this, and it sounds pretty legit, or a word, a man stands up in the assembly and says, I've got a prophecy, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me, it's going to be, tells you when. He says, or maybe you get a letter and my name's on it. And I'm saying it's at hand. It's almost here. It's just around the corner. Get ready. It's just around the corner. He said, don't be troubled by this. Now, this is a good exhortation because we've got flakos <coughs> like this in the world today. <coughs> you probably remember in 1988, there was 88 reasons why Jesus was going to come in 88. <laughs> you know, I was on a radio station in Lansing, Illinois at the time. The next day, I said, did everybody note 
that Jesus didn't come, which meant this guy was a liar. Well, this isn't the only word on this. Jesus had something to say about this. This is Luke 21, 8. He said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. So when we come across prognosticators that say, I know when he's going to come, Put your fingers in your ears and go the other way. Jesus said, don't go with them. They'll not lead you into truth. They'll not lead you into prayer. Watch out for a person that tries to tell you what God hasn't told you. Be careful when a person speaks about Christ coming and Jesus himself didn't talk that way. Or when they talk about the coming of the Lord and the apostles themselves didn't talk that way. What? Well, don't, don't follow after that. So that we can't be simplistic about this. The Lord has not revealed the time and that itself forbids speculation. We just can't speculate here. The situation does not allow, this situation does not allow for delay, sloth, and idleness. See, some people think maybe this will accelerate people's effort a little bit. But the, the uncertainty of it is the thing that promotes mm -hmm. readiness on your part. The fact that you don't know, that's, that's the thing that keeps you ready. Now we also know that there are certain things that God has said would come to pass before the end. This I'm just going to list four of them. There's a, there's a great deal more than this in Scripture. And this kind of compounds things. It makes people, it lends people to their attitude of speculation, to kind of guess about when Christ is coming. Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and he goes on to say, Christ is going to destroy him with the breath of his mouth when he comes. Uh, uh, this, I gather this is the same personality that Daniel talked about. But who it is, see, that's, <laughs> that's in the area of the speculation. People have tried for centuries to tell us who this is. But it's interesting, he didn't tell us who this was. Now, God could be specific. Quite a long time before he sent Nebuchadnezzar, he told to the prophets, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he's going to come. So God, he can be very specific about things. But he's not on this. He's not specific. Nevertheless, this is something it's going to come. Some, some presume this is up in the future. So some say that the falling away has already occurred, which that I'm of the opinion that it, it has, but it is an opinion. I have to, some point, <laughs> I have to admit, it's an opinion. Don't want to linger here. That's not the only thing he said would happen. Luke 21, 24, Jesus said this. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, this is Jerusalem, and be led away captive unto all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, he didn't tell you when that time was, but this is something that's going to happen before he comes again. It's going to happen. That's Jerusalem's going to be controlled by the Gentiles until the time, the period of time the Gentiles are in dominance comes to an end. Then they're not going to tread on Jerusalem anymore. Paul said this in Romans 11, 25, so we'll come for another matter. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Some of the other versions say until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Well, see, that's, this is something on God's calendar, but he hasn't told us what's going to happen. But it's going to happen before Jesus comes to the end of the world. But it's going to happen. Here's another matter in Romans 11, 26. All Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Which is nowhere applied to anybody but the nation of Israel. <coughs> So that's, and then he goes on to say, this is my covenant to them when I take away their sins. So this is something that's, that's going to happen. 
Now someone said, well, look, look, there's got to be then a big gap of time between now and Christ's coming if all these things could happen. But see, there, there's where the person makes their mistake. Right there is where they make their mistake. Don't think that these things I just read about here require a lengthy period of time. That's where people make their mistake. Now let me illustrate this. Why? God created the heavens, the earth, and everything in them in six days. I'm showing you here, God can do a lot in a short time. That's what the scripture says in Exodus 20, verse 11, a point's made of this. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. A lot can happen in a short time. Well, let's take the flood. If you take from the very first to the last day when Noah come out, it was five months, 150 days. Now here's what the scripture says. Until the waters abated. Excuse me, until the waters abated. Genesis 7:21. All flesh died that moved upon the earth both fowl and cattle and beast and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed which is upon the face of the ground, both man, cattle, creeping things, fowl of the air. They were destroyed from the earth only Noah and only Noah remained alive and they that were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So that'd be like the maximum that's a lot to happen in that. That's a lot to happen in that period of time. He completely wiped the world clean and started afresh with eight people. <laughs> See, God, a lot of things can happen in a short period of time. Don't get used to things happening after a long period. Well, here's another example. Israel spent 430 years in Egypt. Four and one-third centuries almost twice as long as our nation has been around. And the scripture says of their deliverance, Exodus 12, 41, it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self-same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So in <coughs> one day, 430 years run and done, the people came out. See, God can do a lot. <laughs> he, and this wasn't a handful of people. It took them less time to get out. It took less time for these millions of people to get out than it took 70 souls to get in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When Jacob and 70 souls went down in there. A lot can happen in a short period of time. Isaiah poses the question, Who hath heard of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Well, that's a, that's a vague prophetic reference to the, we understand, to the beginning of the body of Christ. But in one day in Jerusalem, the church was born. Kicked off with 3,000 souls. If you were to say, how long does it take to win 3,000 souls? Let's say you're kind of a, a religious strategist. huh? You want to market a technique. Write a book on winning 3,000 souls. How long would you say it takes to win 3,000 souls? One someone uh, came to Joplin here a few years back. I forget the number they were going to win. Do you remember what? 4,000. 4,000. And they had to have some months advance work and a lot of preparation to do it. They incidentally didn't come through, so I gather that, would they, that this was not from God. But here's 3,000 souls won, not in just one day, in just a very short time. In fact, about the ninth hour of the day, if I remember right. The thir third hour. It was in the third hour of the day. <coughs> Sometime before noon, this happened. A lot can happen in a short period of time. Book of Acts says that they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the name and number of souls came to 3,000. And my point in all of this is that the fact that some things in Scripture must happen that does not equate to a lengthy period of time is required for them to happen. All these things can happen in a short period of time. 
period of time that happens so fast that people that aren't ready couldn't even get ready to receive it. And so this doesn't interfere with the, un with the uncertainty of Christ coming at all. This does not mean, well, this must not be the time I can just kind of slough off and do my own thing. When I see some of these things start to happen, then I'll, I'll pick up the pace. Well, see, this, is, this isn't for that purpose at all. Now we know that in relation to time, therefore it's uncertain. The fact that God has spoken about certain things from all the way from a falling away to the conversion of Israel does not mean that these things are going to require a tremendous period of time to happen. And there's enough question mark about them, you can't really form a theology around it. It's that vague, you can't really write a book on this with a timetable because there's just not that much information on it in Scripture. What I'm saying is that's on purpose. God's done that on purpose. One thing we do know about, about the matter of Christ coming in relation to time is at the conclusion of time. Mm -hmm. We do know that. Now there's a, there's a, the heavens and earth that now are, are going to end. They're going to come to an end. Peter's, and Peter connected it with Christ's coming as a thief. He connects it with that event. Here's what he says in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy God, conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. For in the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So whatever a person thinks about the end of the world, it's going to happen when Jesus comes as a thief in the night. That's exactly what he said, in the which. That's when it's going to happen. So there's no question about this. Now in further confirmation of this, Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.8 he pray, says that God will confirm you unto the end. That ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the point I'm making here is that the end is connected with Jesus coming again. Not the end of the world as it now is. It is connected with Christ's return. Again, in 1 Peter 1, 3, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that was to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the, in relation to time, time is going to end when Jesus... There's not going to be any further history written on as we know it in this world after Jesus comes. That's, that's just Either that or we're going to have to take Jehudai's pen knife and cut these things out of the Bible because they are a thorn to that view. The end. And time, incidentally, is related to the present heavens and earth. There is a time related to the world to come. Time, as we understand it, is the consequence of the bondage of corruption. Time is, from one viewpoint, time is progressing to the end when Christ will come. From another point, the clock's winding down. <laughs> Just like the old wind-up clock, you wind it up and it winds down and then it stops. Well, time, time's like that. It's a consequence of nature being blighted with corruption because of man's sin. It's, it, so when nature's done away, time's, time's gone. And we're in, another, we're in another domain. So when the scriptures speak about uh, the, the heavens and the earth in the face of God's full glory, Here's what, it, here's what it says. I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face, when there was a confrontation, from whose face the heaven and earth fled away and there was found no place for them. So when they, I speak as a man, when the heavens are pulled asunder and, and the glory of the Lord is seen in fullness, the heaven and earth, that's it. That's it. It can't survive it. Why can't? Because it's been blinded by sin. Mm -hmm. And when anything connected with sin is exposed to the glory of God, that's its termination. Amen. It's ended right there. 
Have seen all of these things, there's a certain necessity if, to be ready. To be ready for this. This whole situation throws us into a condition of readiness. Now this is an approach to, uh, from an intellectual viewpoint. It's approached from a faith viewpoint. And there's a faith thinks, but it thinks different than the mind of the flesh thinks. The mind of the flesh thinks in terms of tables and certain structures and this sort of thing, time periods, that's how the flesh thinks. But the faith doesn't think like this. Faith proceeds forward to the next significant event and adjusts for it. That's what faith is. So faith, faith's not looking forward to the coming of the Antichrist. Even though, even though the scriptures are the man of sin. Maybe you speak as the scriptures speak. Faith's not looking forward to the coming of the man of sin. Faith's not looking forward to a falling away. Faith's looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Amen. There's a big difference in the two. Amen. If you look forward to the man of sin, you enter into a field of speculation. And you begin speculating on what might happen. Who, who could it be and so forth. Well, you're down in a sinkhole. You're down in the sinkhole of vanity when you do that. It will not yield what God wants. God wants you to anchor your hope and faith in the coming of the Lord and then set yourself to be ready for it. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready. Be ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now that behind this is he established in the parable of the ten virgins when this begins to happen it, it does appear as though Christ, there's going to be some preliminary warnings about Christ coming but the, it, it will not provide time for people to change he will just provide time for them to start crying out and calling out for rocks and mountains and the vanity of life will be seen but no, they may knock on the door to get in but nothing's going to happen be ready now I exhort you be ready if you're if you're not ready now, you really have no guarantee you'll ever be ready. Your only guarantee that you're going to be ready is that you're ready now. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, we don't know when Christ is coming. We don't know when you're done, going to die either. We don't know when time's going to run out for you either. Mm -hmm. Be ready. Luke, 20, Luke 12, 35 through 40. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Be ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he shall return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open to him immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Mm -hmm. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And it shall end if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, that, that's watching, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken up. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So don't, don't be outsmarted by a worldly wise man. If a thief... Uh, Hung us, hung and put a note in your mailbox and said, "I'm going to rob you to Tuesday night at 10 o'clock." Will you be, <laughs> you be ready there for him? Well, the Lord said, "I'm, I'm coming, and I'm going to take away everything that's temporal when I come." In a sense, I'm going to come like a robber to people who live in the world and, and live for the flesh. I'm going to take away everything. It's, but I'm just not going to tell you when I'm going to come. But be ready. Live in a state of readiness. Now, if you want to talk about time, the time you need to really be able to discern isn't the time Jesus is going to come, it's the time you're in. That's the time you've got to discern. And here's what it says, Romans 13, 11, we're told this. And that knowing the time, that now, it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So what time is it? You should be able to think this out. When I was, when I was, when I believed, when I came into Christ, when I was saved, however you want to put it, it was in order that I might live forever with Him. 
And that time is nearer now than when I believed. So I ought to be more ready than when I was baptized. I ought to be more sensitive than when I was baptized. I ought to be more holy than when I first came into Christ. But this isn't the case for a lot of people. If you find people that are less holy now, less interested now, they're not ready. They're not ready. The Lord said, be ready. Be ready. 1 Thessalonians, he states it this way, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. There's no question about this. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Be ye therefore, brethren, ye, but ye, brethren, are not in the darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Well, you don't want the day to overtake you. What's the picture? The picture is that people who are not ready are like running in the opposite direction. They're like, just like Adam. They're running away from God. And they're all immersed in things that are going to pass away. But the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief of the night. It's going to outrun time. It's going to outrun nature. It's going to overtake mm -hmm. and destroy everything and everybody that's not ready. Now you will come, people will come to a point where the moral and spiritual change is no longer possible. This is viewed from two different ways in Scripture. One is a person is in state of unbelief so long, and they resist the Holy Spirit so long, and they quench the Holy Spirit so long that finally they can't be recovered. That's one view. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse 4 through 6, tell you about that. And that's true. That's why if you're dull toward God, like, resolve it tonight. There is a, I deplore these courses that teach people how to live close to God, and you've got to take a six-week course, and I wonder, what if Jesus comes in week two? Like, what are we going to do? You have to resolve to make the correction now, and when you do, you get the power to do it. It's just like the man that was, that was palsied on a pallet. When Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, there was, it, he wasn't to like study about this and say, someone carry me home and I'd like to kind of think this out a little bit. He had to right then make extended effort to get up off that pallet and when he did, God empowered him to do Amen. it. The man of the withered hand, from, the, from a physical, physical viewpoint or physiological viewpoint, it was impossible for him to stretch that hand out. But when the Lord told him, stretch forth thy hand, as soon as he exerted the will to do it, he was able to do it. All right, he said, be ready. When you exert the effort, honestly in your heart, you exert the effort to do it, God empowers you and you will be ready. Mm -hmm. Amen. Enable you to be ready. That to me is a piece of good news. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now here's a word from Jesus about waiting too long. Strive to enter the straight gate. You notice this, you probably know this, but for the younger, straight, C is spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. -T. The G-H isn't in there. If it G-H in there, it means straight, not crooked. But straight without the G-H means hard. It means difficult. It means it's narrow, so you've got to squeeze through it. It's a different kind of road, uh, different kind of road and gate. Strive to enter the straight. The gate's so narrow that flesh can't get through it. But if you strive to enter, when you go through it, like sloughs off the flesh. <laughs> Can you see that? Strive to enter the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. Now, notice how he elaborates. When once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know not you, whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in our presence, that us taught in our streets. He shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. <coughs> So there, there's things about that text that I don't understand, but it seems quite clear to me that Jesus is saying there's going to come a point in time when you'll know what's happening. 
but it will just be too late to make any adjustment. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's, the, what's the answer to this? The answer to this is not to figure out when he's coming. That's not the answer. Right. The answer is get ready. Mm -hmm. Then you have nothing to worry about. You know, whether it's, whether it's dying or whether it's being alive when the Lord Jesus comes, a thought that uh, was fostered by another good brother that I heard say something like this, that there in your life here in the world, the angels ministered to you. They've been sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. And who knows the mighty deliverances they've wrought for each one of us. But you may be sure when your time comes to die or when Jesus comes, the angels will still rally around you. <laughs> That'd be like the last battle you'll be fighting. They'll rally around you. And if you're ready now, whatever in the back of your mind, whatever you think might be a handicap or you might be not able to face you're going to have a lot of help on that day. That's what I'm saying. If you're ready, there's going to be a lot of help so that you won't be to be afraid when Jesus comes. You, you will break forth in songs of joy. Believe me, if you're ready. And, and grace, salvation is calculated to help you be ready. And that's what it's all about. It's not all about not being what you used to be. That's how you start. But it's about being ready for what God has appointed you to be. You see, life itself is uncertain, isn't it? James said, uh, you, you don't know what will be on the morrow. <laughs> Why are you speculating about Christ coming when you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow? My goodness, if, if you could figure out when Jesus was going to come, you should pretty well be able to figure out what's going to be tomorrow, shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. But he says, you don't even know tomorrow. Let's not be trying to figure out way down there in the future sometime. You can't even figure out tomorrow. Why not? Because your life is a vapor. Mm -hmm. It appears a little time and vanishes away. See, life's uncertain. Time's uncertain. That's why the coming of the Lord's uncertain. So we have one alternative. Be ready. Live in a state of watchfulness and readiness. Peter said, for all flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower of the earth falls away. So that's, that's life. It's, it's going to end. The best of it is going to end in this world. Well, whatever preparation, what's the, what's the res, kind of the conclusion to all of these things? Christ coming in relation to time is, well, he hasn't told you the time. And you may figure out quite an elaborate table, but when it's all said and done, and we just have to read these verses again, we have to read them again and say, Lord, help me to believe these verses. You... We know not the time, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, we just don't know. But we do know that God has given everything pertaining to life and godliness, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the holy angels, the intercession of Christ at the right hand of God, all to make you ready when the time comes, and in the time of readiness, incidentally, when you're ready, that's when you get all the supplies that you need. <laughs> yeah. When you're in a state of readiness, that's when you get grace to help in a time of need. See, that's when you get what you need, is when you're in a ready state. If you're not in a ready state for Christ, you're not in a ready state to receive anything from God. <clears throat> Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Well, may the Lord bless you as you prepare for the coming of the Lord. Uncertain from the standpoint of time, but 